this week on Arts Insight. A world of large scale art. When I did the Chase Bank mural, it was a six month project from meeting with their, uh, their team of people. From start to finish, it took me six months. The painted body. Nudity does not equal sex. Nudity equals beauty. Nudity equals freedom. Turning alternative rock into an art form. And the idea was to pull up all these keyboard loops as we went along. Um, just press play, not knowing what was going to come up, what key it's going to be in, where it goes, and just start improvising. Sculpting a wonderland. I love to sculpt interactive sculpture like this. This Alice in Wonderland piece is the epitome of being <laughs> interactive. And the lost spirits. Kids were asked to draw butterflies, create some sort of butterfly that they could commemorate to a child lost in the Holocaust. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Now, you might recognize the view. We're on top of Raven Tower, White Oak Music Hall. Just take a look at our beautiful city. Can you imagine the wealth of stories out there? Well, right here we have a show full of some of our recent favorites from all around Houston. First up, the story of artist Suzanne Sellers. She never let the size and scope of her dreams limit her or her art. So she brings them to life in her large scale murals. My art is unique because it comes from me. It's a personal endeavor. It's a personal way to self-express. It speaks a language that kind of overrides any social, economic, racial, educational barrier. It uh, enables you to integrate your mind, your body, and your spirit together in one activity. I'm Suzanne Elizabeth Sellers, and I'm an artist. I became interested in art from an early age. I grew up in the southeast part of Houston in a large Italian Catholic family. I can't ever remember a time when I wasn't creating something, whether it was painting, drawing, and that's just who I was. It's who I was then, it's who I am today. My own personal work, I work in acrylics, and when I do public murals, I work on large scale, uh, either using paint or tile work. A muralist is someone who um, paints on a wall, and that wall can be small, it can be interior, it can be exterior, it can be in the form of contemporary or realistic, uh, whatever you choose it to be. When I did the Chase Bank mural, it was a six month project from meeting with their, uh, their team of people. From start to finish, it took me six months. That was a parking lot, and they were going to make that into a, kind of a park setting. They thought a mural would be a very good idea there. And we decided the best thing to go in that particular area was maybe a reflection of the history of Houston. It was just a fantastic and exciting and just very, very challenging opportunity. It was wonderful. Some of my murals are uh, in a style called trompe l'oeil, which is a French term meaning trick the eye. Basically, it's a matter of just creating an illusion of uh, windows and doors and architectural facades. You really have to learn to work with just lights and darks, because that's all it is. It's just an illusion, trying to trick someone into seeing what is not really there. The tile mural I completed for the, uh, it was the Houston Fire Department. They wanted that to be tile but it was about 60 feet by 16 foot tall, so that was a lot of tiles. And uh, it took more organizational skills than I thought I ever encompassed. Found some photos that represented that particular Denver Harbor community, worked with the fire department, and just tried to collage a series of images that represented the neighborhood as well as what the fire department did. And then it was just a process of firing about 4,000 tiles and uh, getting them up there on that wall. It is a challenge, uh, artistically and just physically, to complete something on that scale. 
When you do a mural such as the ones I completed for the Children's Assessment Center, you have to realize that you have an entirely different audience. You have mostly children. You have mostly uh, parents who are maybe in distress or it's not a great place for them to be. And my murals are more whimsical, more colorful, uh, more images that they can relate to and make them feel comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. When I'm doing a, a small scale work, what I do is I go out and I just search for maybe an inspiration. I may put it on the computer and uh, edit it and just find the perfect way that I want to see it. Then I come to the canvas and begin to draw it out, uh, usually with charcoal, and kind of loosely block it in maybe with color. And that's when I start to fragment it. And then it slowly begins to focus and to take shape. My environment inspires my designs. I just look at everything that I see. The way the sunlight hits the trunk of a tree, or if I'm going downtown, I love the way the light may play against the buildings, or I say on a construction worker's helmet. Every artist brings something unique to their own artist because they take from their own experiences, their travels, their location, their history. As an artist, I've evolved into becoming more willing to take risk. I'm bolder, I'm brighter, I'm more confident, and I think that shows in my work. Find out more, visit SuzanneSellers.com. Next, how to make superheroes, villains, the human body itself into art. Artist Vanetta Berry transforms skin with precise strokes of paint. Through her eyes, the human body is a moving canvas. I really try to design based on movement and based on what kinds of things can we create that is specific because this person will be alive and breathing and moving. I don't have the same connotations that most people have about nudity. I don't have this instant Nudity equals sex. Nudity does not equal sex. Nudity equals beauty. Nudity equals freedom. My name is Vanetta Berry and I am a body artist. So I go to gallery openings and I see all these people nibbling on their cheese and drinking their little wines and it looks so fun. And so I came up with this concept of creating a person as this decadent piece of wine and cheese. She will have wine pouring down her arm and then she will have a cheese plate on her belly area and the coolest part my favorite are the grapes. I actually thought I was going to be an animator and an illustrator. I am a comic book nerd and an animation geek. I know lots of cosplayers who really enjoy getting painted. We just kind of go through all of the different characters. really wanted to do a lot of children's book illustrations, so I have a fantasy type realism that I really focused on, and trompe l'oeil was really a style that I focused on. So I did a lot of drawing things that look like other things so that it could be disguised. And then when I got into body painting, camouflage body painting just spoke to me. I like to use what I do to help people. One of my very first models, um, actually she was my very first model, I painted her as a tiger. And halfway through, she looks in the mirror and she's like, oh my God, I look beautiful. And I said, yes, of course, you look gorgeous. She said, no, you don't understand. 
she had been burned on her neck and her chin, and she never felt beautiful because of that. That scar was something that she felt very self-conscious about. So what I really enjoy about what I do is I got to show her a different version of herself. The temporary nature of my work is actually kind of nice. When I was more of a studio artist, I struggled with looking at my work on a regular basis. Like most people, they work and they work and they work on the same piece for months. And I hated that. I hated going back to it because I always end up overworking it. So for me, working in this way, very fast and very temporary, makes me have to commit immediately. It pushes my creativity in ways that I wouldn't be able to, to push myself otherwise. I get to paint, I get to stand back for a sec, look at it, okay, get back in there, tweak it, and then I'm done. See more of Vanetta's work at vanettaberry.carbonmade.com. Com. Now, Brandon and Benjamin worked together in a local music shop, but fast forward over 15 years and they're much better known as the Helio Sequence, an alt-rock band that redefines their sound as they evolve. Hi, I'm Brandon. And I'm Benjamin. And uh, we're the Helio Sequence. We grew up in Beaverton, Oregon, which is, you know, this kind of it's kind of a miserable place. You know, it's a suburb, there's no culture. We bonded over the fact that we really, you know, we felt like there was more to life than just putting your head down and doing nine to five and, and being surrounded with, you know, I don't know, just this, this suburban sprawl. So it was really important to us to get into the city and to do something that we felt like was meaningful, you know, and that's probably part of being like the tail end of Generation X. Feeling like, you know, you, you could do something meaningful with your life, you know, but it's, it's really true that I think that's been a big part of, you know, our whole thing is just trying to do something that actually is contributing something positive to the universe. And, yeah. yeah. And when we started our band, you know, our dream was, I would say, oddly enough, to, to be on a label as amazing as Sub Pop. And my thought was, wouldn't it be amazing to write a song and have it out there in the world and have somebody way out in Ohio or, you know, way out in Florida or these places that I could never imagine at that point because I'd never been, you know, that far from home. Um, and just have this secret knowledge, you know, it's it's helping someone out there, or someone out there can relate to to the music that that we make, that um, we write, in the same way that the bands that were so important to us helped us get through all the growth you go through in life. In the past, you know, our songs have actually come together in in parts. We'll have you know a keyboard part, and we'll layer something. Another part will come in, and the songs kind of come to life as they're layered and built. Um, Benjamin had a bunch of keyboard loops, probably 20 or 30, maybe more. And we set up a PA that was also being recorded. We, we have our own studio, and so we have the luxury of doing this. And set up mics on the guitars, over the drums, and the idea was to pull up all these keyboard loops as we went along. Um, just press play, not knowing what was going to come up, what key it's going to be in, where it goes, and just start improvising um, over it. And we did, you know, 15, 20 of these improvisations, and Battle Lines was one of these at probably 10 minutes or more. And then we would use that as a raw material for the song. I view success, you know, as the, you know, the connection we're able to make with with people, you know, our fans, um, and anybody who listens to our music, you know, and try to kind of always take, um, take myself back to, to being that 13 year old who just picked up guitar and was just learning how to write songs.
To learn more about the Helio Sequence, visit heliosequence.com. Up next, more than 150 years after the first edition of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, one local artist brings the childhood story to life. Ever since I could pick up a crayon, I wanted to be an artist. When I started sculpting in the beach in Boca Raton and then came back here and tried to teach myself how to do clay and how to sculpt, I knew clay was it. My name is Brigitte Mongeon and I am a sculptor and author. Well, I have so many different aspects of my art. I have always liked to draw the face, the human form. I think people are great. I've always said that I can see the world in the face of the elderly, in the heavens, in the face of a child. When I talk about the people that I have sculpted in the past that are deceased, it's a very emotional moment. Some parents want to have it done, some parents could never see it being done with their child. And so when the parents have come to terms with that and they're ready to go, I help parents through the grieving process. I help them celebrate the life of their child. What inspires me is that collaboration between the client and myself. B.B. King was an important element in my life and that sculpture, just being able to create it, having the interaction with the man. He was just a loving, and I just had this strange feeling when I was sculpting him that he knew what it was going to mean to me. I think the newsboy is another favorite. I think because he is interactive, because he's holding that newspaper and he's shouting, and because probably because I'm a writer. <laughs> I love to sculpt interactive sculpture like this. This Alice in Wonderland piece is the epitome of being <laughs> interactive. Jerry Rubenstein commissioned me to sculpt his mom for the Evelyn Rubenstein Jewish Community Center. And once that was done, he said, I'd like another sculpture of my mom for the park. And then he came and he brought me some photographs of the Alice in Wonderland in New York. I thought, this is interesting. So it kind of morphed from there. And I did not know that it was in the public domain. I certainly didn't know the story was 150 years old last year. And that's where the 150 hidden items came in. You'll be able to come to the park and sit at this magnificent table and have tea with the Mad Hatter, Alice, the March Hare, and the Dormouse. Some of the biggest challenges when creating my art right now is actually the digital technology and the traditional. <laughs> I started out sculpting traditionally, which is taking clay and moving it around. But one of the things that happens is that our art actually ends up injuring our bodies. When I started to have trouble with my hand, and someone had suggested try digital uh, in the computer. It takes nothing to hold a stylus and I can move a stylus around much easier. I can flip a sculpture in the, uh, much easier in the computer where I would have to be an acrobat to do some of the things a lot of times to be able to sculpt. So if I can do some of the processes digitally in the computer, then I'm saving myself, my body, and uh, a lot of time. The process, it's much bigger and much more intricate than it would be if I were just sculpting traditionally. The next process is for me to start to gather the reference. From there, I sculpt small maquettes, small clay maquettes, and those maquettes are then scanned upstairs with a 3D scanner. And then the 3D scanner has a digital model and that is sent off to Synapsis in Oklahoma. That's my vendor who does the, the CNC milling. It stands for Computer Numerically Controlled Milling. And then we have all these foam pieces that come back here and we have to put them together. We glue all the foam pieces together and from there we go to putting clay and wax on them. Now we're going to cut them up in many, many pieces and make rubber molds with them. The rubber molds are sent to a foundry in Santa Fe. So they will paint the molds with wax. It's also referred to as the lost wax method of bronze casting. So they have to match all of my texture. And I'll spend probably a month in the foundry going through every piece and, and doing circles and making sure that all the metal is perfect. I think my heart and soul is in all my pieces. For me, it is the emotional attachment. It is the element of excitement and with each piece, if it's a deceased loved one, there's that connection and that passion to that loved one. If it's a portrait of somebody, then hopefully I've sparked an interest. It's going to spark an interaction both physically, because I do like to have the sculptures interact physically, but also intellectually. You'll ask more questions, you'll probe further, you'll go deeper into the rabbit hole. <laughs> You can find out more at creativesculpture.com. And finally tonight, Houston kids can make handmade butterflies to experience a unique connection to the past. The artwork is a creative way to express the enormity of lost lives. 
Butterflies really embody transformation and transcendence. Through this project, you feel that. The poem by Pavel Friedman called The Butterfly inspired us to create a lesson plan that we took to schools starting here in the Houston area and then eventually worldwide that gave the kids an opportunity to identify with the loss of 1.5 million children that perished during the Holocaust. Kids were asked to draw butterflies, create some sort of butterfly that they could commemorate to a child lost in the Holocaust. And they would hang these delicate, fragile, beautiful butterflies and they'd hang them from their classroom ceilings. Kids would come into their classroom, it was beautiful, it was wonderful, it was delicate, it was just as, as amazing as any butterfly would be. And the teacher would come in one day and she would randomly cut down their butterfly. And this, you can imagine, made children upset, saddened, angry. Why'd you cut down my butterfly? Well, the truth is, there was no reason. There was no reason the children of the Holocaust perished as well. So that lesson connected the kids of today to the children of the Holocaust. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. About 11 years ago, when the Holocaust Museum Houston was celebrating its 10th anniversary, I interviewed my mother for the project. I was looking through photos of hers, old photos, and I found for the very first time a picture of her little sister, and she was in a butterfly costume. She perished upon arrival in Auschwitz. That has been chilling to me ever since. My father was a survivor to me like no other, for me as his daughter. To watch how someone can overcome so much and, and, and still be hopeful about the world that we live in, um, I was always in awe of that. These butterflies came to us from all over the world. Um, with the exception of one continent, Antarctica, we received them from everywhere. We created an exhibit in our museum um, for people to see, and we started a uh, traveling exhibit, which many Houstonians can now see here in Houston uh, at Two Allen Center. We have a wonderful exhibit that's going to be here for three months. Butterflies are made of all media, wire, fabric, glass, metal, paper origami, crochet, needlepoint. Needle point. There also are fragments of poems, the poems that were written in Theresienstadt on some of these butterflies, as well as some of the names of the children who perished at this time. Each one speaks to you differently. Some are funny, some are sweet, and some just tug at your heartstrings. There's six exhibits that'll be traveling throughout the community and just seeing one isn't enough. You really want to see all the different cases. In just a short few years, we won't have any Holocaust survivors that can actually go into the schools, go out into the community and talk about their experiences. And so it's up to us, second generation, third generation, to carry on their message of hope. If we leave no other message than hope for tomorrow through this project, then, then we've won. The Butterfly Project can go on and on and it will continue to resonate with children of tomorrow as well. See more at butterflies.hmh.org. And that does it for this episode of Arts Insight. For all of us here at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching and have a great week.